Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing a quick run through of my top 10 books of Q2 of 2019. So that is April, May, and June of 2019. I have a stack of books here. We'll do this for the thumbnail. Hey. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. So, in at number 10, we have John Wyndham, The Day of the Triffids. This is like classic sort of science fiction slash eco ecological horror. There's basically a comet in the sky and that kind of heralds the arrival of these triffids, which are like man-eating plants. And at first they don't seem too sinister, but as time goes on, they become more and more sinister. Another very important thing is that this comet basically causes blindness of anyone who looked at it. So we follow our main character, he's actually Big E. So we follow our main character who's actually been in hospital. He's been having an operation on his eyes and he kind of comes around in the aftermath of this, what's almost an, an extinction level event, you know? And what I thought was really interesting about this is the way that Wyndham dealt with suicide. So basically the world's ending, most people are blind and a lot of people have just given up hope and so they just kill themselves. And I think especially for the time that this book was written and published, that was quite out there you know but I also think it's very realistic I also really liked as well the way that the triffids themselves actually learn they were described as being a bit like a hive mind a bit like ants and so towards the end they're starting to try and rebuild a safer area of society but the triffids are starting to get used to the different traps that they lay for them and are starting to show more and more of this rudimentary intelligence and uh, yeah, it's just a great read. It's one of those ones that's kind of stuck with me after I read it and I keep thinking back to it. And also I can see how much zombie horror and just survival horror in general, and dystopian and all that kind of stuff is all heavily influenced by Day of the Triffids. So uh, yeah, I would definitely check this out and I'm looking forward to reading more Wyndham. In at number nine, we have the Dhammapada. So this is Penguin Little Black Classic number 80. Ancient aphorisms on endurance, self-control and perfect joy, widely acknowledged as the Buddha's own teachings. And what's cool about this is there's just so much wisdom in here. I'm gonna just flick in at random. Those who make channels for water control the waters. Makers of arrows make the arrows straight. Carpenters control their timber and the wise control their own minds. When a man knows the solitude of silence and feels the joy of quietness, he is then free from fear and sin and he feels the joy of the Dhamma. And we have one on endurance here. I will enjoy words that hurt in silent peace as the strong elephant endures in battle arrows sent by the bow, for many people lack self-control. They take trained elephants to battle and kings ride on royal trained elephants. The best of men are self-trained men, those who can endure abuse in peace. Mules when trained are good and so are noble horses of Sindh. Strong elephants when trained are good, but the best is the man who trains himself. For it is not with those riding animals that a man will reach the land unknown. Nirvana is reached by that man who wisely, heroically trains himself. So this for me, I think, I saw this as a bit like The Art of War by Sun Tzu, except much more for leading our personal and day-to-day -day lives. But there's just so much wisdom here, and so much you can learn. And uh, even though it's, you know, hundreds slash thousands of years old, I just thought it was phenomenal. And it, again, just definitely recommend it. And this isn't the kind of stuff that I'd normally read, like religious or quasi-religious texts. It's not really my thing, but um, there's some, some life-changing stuff in this. In at number eight, we have Strange Weather by Joe Hill. And this is actually four different novellas pulled together. So I will give you my thoughts on each of them. Snapshot was the first one. It actually reminded me of The Sun Dog by his father, Stephen King. And it basically follows... This guy has got a Polaroid camera, but when he takes photos of people, it kind of de devours bits of their souls. And it's kind of been given as the explanation of why one of the characters has Alzheimer's. It was all right. Uh, Loaded is the second one in this. This was by far the best and has one of the bleakest endings I've ever read. The only ending that I can think of as bleaker is the ending to the movie of The Mist, which is based on a Stephen King short story as well. And as you can imagine, Loaded is basically about guns and it's kind of Joe Hill's take on gun control and why it might be a good thing, but at the same time showing, you know, these darker sides of humanity, really. Then we have a loft, which is set on this. Basically, this guy jumps out of a parachute, doing a sponsored parachute jump against his better judgment and ends up on like this cloud. And it's like a solid cloud and it's kind of providing sustenance for him. And while he try tries to figure out a way to get off this cloud, we start to dive into his past and we see more of his past and uh, basically why he did this parachute jump in the first place as well. And then finally we have rain and it's basically this brutal rain. I think it's like metal rain of like nail length uh, shards of, of metal are coming from the sky. So it's obviously quite apocalyptic. 
but it's also kind of a parody of apocalyptic stuff as well and I actually think I would have liked that more if Hill had gone full apocalyptic with it but I understand he has done that with one of his other books which I haven't read yet uh, The Fireman I think is it The Fireman I'm not sure but all in all, a great read, four fantastic novellas, and very much deserves a spot on the list. All right, in at number seven, we have A Whiff of Death by Isaac Asimov. This took me by surprise, because I mostly know Asimov as a writer of science fiction, but this is a murder mystery. But it does have these science elements, as you can kind of tell, I, I guess, from this sort of test tube thing here. It's basically a murder mystery set in, like, the advanced chemistry part of, like, an American college. And the guy who is investigating the murder is a potential suspect of it himself. He's a lecturer and it's one of his pupils who's died. And we get this like real inside look at like American academia, which isn't something I'm really familiar with, but Asimov did it really well to such a point that it, it wasn't off-putting and actually I felt as though I learned about it. And also it was just, just a really well-constructed murder mystery as well. And uh, yeah, it, it gets this, this point on this list just because I wasn't expecting great things from it and it was, it was very good. Probably a solid like 4.25, 4.5 out of 5 book. All right, then we have Samuel Pepys, The Great Fire of London. This is Penguin Little Black Classic number 47. Originally written in code, Pepys' diary includes his unforgettable eyewitness account of the 1666 fire. It actually also includes some stuff on the plague, which was knocking around in 1665. And what's cool about this is you get this blow-by-blow -blow account, which just isn't really poss possible from anywhere else. So you see him, for example, he talks about this fire has just started. And then, you know, a day later, he's like, well, Bob's had to move in with his brother James. And then a day later, Bob and James have both had to move out of James's house to go to James's church. And then a day later, James's church is on fire and they're having to move all their stuff out again. Peeps himself buried his wine and his cheese to avoid the fire. And like, I looked up online, I think it was like 70% of London was destroyed. But only four people died, which is just mind-boggling. And uh, yeah, it was really fascinating. I want to I wanna read the full peeps his diary but it might be a bit hard going and also some of the language is difficult so I'm going to read you a sample paragraph here this is the 7th of September 1666 up by five o'clock and blessed be God find all well and by water to Paul's wharf walked thence and saw all the town burned and a miserable sight of Paul's church with all the roofs fallen and the body of the choir fallen into St Faith's Paul's school also Ludgate Fleet Street my father's house and the church and a good part of the temple the like so to Creed's lodging near the new exchange, and there find him laid down upon a bed, the house all unfurnished, there being fears of the fires coming to them. They have there borrowed a shirt off him, and washed. To Sir W. Coventry at St. James's, who lay without curtains, having removed all his goods, as the king at Whitehall and everybody had done and was doing. He hopes we shall have no public distractions upon this fire, which is what everybody fears, because of the talk of the French having a hand in it. And it is a proper time for discontents, but all men's minds are full of care to protect themselves and save their goods. The militia is in arms everywhere. Our fleet, he tells me, have been in sight of one another, and most unhappily by foul weather were parted to our great loss, as in reason they do conclude, the Dutch being come out only to make a show and please their people, but in very bad condition as to stores, victuals, and men. They are at Bullen, and our fleet come to St. Ellen's. We have got nothing, but have lost one ship, but he knows not what. So Pepys was actually in charge of the Navy as well, so that's why there's a lot of stuff there about the Navy and international politics. All, all good stuff. In at number five, we have Alien by Alan Dean Foster. This is the novelization of the movie, but Alan Dean Foster's a cracking writer. I mean, this was obviously written when Alien came out, and Foster's now writing the novelizations of the new Star Wars movie. So that just shows you how highly regarded he is in the sci-fi industry, and for how long as well. He wrote Midworld, which is Todd the Librarian's favorite book, or at least one of them. And here, I think this was better than the movie. There were, weren't many changes, but the changes that there were were really good. So, for example, in the movie, the Nostromo was carrying ore, whereas in this, it was carrying, like, unrefined petroleum, the idea being that mankind had used all of its natural resources and so was having to look elsewhere for petroleum. But then that's also why there's such a big explosion when the ship self-destructs, because it's literally a petrol refinery going up in flames. There was also a really great addition to where, you know, the scene with the alien coming out of the guy's chest, where it bursts out of his chest, and in the book... Foster was writing about the stench of it because of the perforated bowels and all this stuff. And I just thought that was really well done because the temptation would be to look at the film, write about what you see, and that's it. But Foster went one further and started thinking about that, uh, like the smells. Uh, and again, the smells of the other people on the ship because they're not washed very well and, you know, they're all in these cramped quarters. It felt much more cramped and claustrophobic in this than it did watching the movie. There's also a character in this 
who is black in the movie. You know, as far as I know, it just wasn't mentioned, or maybe it was, and I glossed over it. I don't know. Um, but I think that's also a good thing in that, like, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, I guess you know, representation is good, but not just for the sake of just being. Oh, we'll have one black character on a spaceship, so it's futuristic. So, yeah, it could all be black. Who knows? Who cares? In at number four, we have The Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. And this is basically about the Queen. <laughs> so the Queen discovers a love for reading. And before long, you know, on all of her official engagements, when she's waving out of the windows of her, uh, her, of her car, she's actually got a book on her lap and she's reading that. The problem is, is that the royal staff don't really approve of it, especially when she decides she wants to start writing. Not just a memoir of what it's like to be the Queen, but I think she starts wanting to write a romance novel. And this is just a book for readers, you know? The quote on the back here is, Oh, Norman, said the Queen, the Prime Minister doesn't seem to have read Hardy. Perhaps you could find him one of our old paperbacks on his way out. And there's just so much sass coming from the Queen in this. The ending on it was great as well. And I just thought, considering I'm not much of a fan of the royal family, this was just so well executed, so funny, but so biting as well. And also, like I say, just a book for readers. The number of literary references in this, you know, it was just great. Definitely recommend it. Shadows on the Tundra by Dahlia Grinkovirsute. I don't know how to pronounce it. And I'm just going to read you the blurb on this one, really. I think an extraordinary piece of international survival literature joining the likes of Primo Levi and Anne Frank. In 1941, 14-year-old Dahlia Grinkovicerte and her family are deported from their native Lithuania to a labour camp in Siberia. As the strongest member of her family, the girl submits to 16 hours a day of manual labour. At the age of 21, Dahlia escapes the gulag and returns to Lithuania. She writes her memories on scraps of paper and buries them in a glass jar in the garden, fearing they might be discovered by the KGB. They are not found until 1991, four years after her death. This is the story Dahlia Grinkovicerte buried. The immediacy of her writing bears witness not only to the suffering she endured, but also to the hope that sustained her. It is a Lithuanian tale that, like its author, beats the odds to survive. And I mean, you can tell from that, it's just an important book that should be read. But also, just the brutality of it all, like, they were just forced labour and all of this stuff. Um, and, like, when people were dying, they were in Siberia, so the permafrost was frozen year-round, so they couldn't bury the bodies. You know, people starving, people getting dysentery, all of this stuff. And again, because they couldn't bury the bodies, that was leading to illness as well. It just is mind-blowing what these what these people went through. And uh, I'm just really glad that the story survived. And this, to me, again, it says, like, joining the likes of Primo Levi and Anne Frank. This is probably the most touching Holocaust slash World War II survival story I've read, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't think you should compare them and that kind of thing. But and also, I've only read the abridged diaries of Anne Frank, so I do need to read the full thing. But my goodness, just read this, please. In at number two, we have Plato, Socrates' Defense. This is Penguin Little Black Classic number fifty-two. Sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of ancient Athens, Socrates, Plato's teacher, founded Western philosophy. Um, what's really moving about this is uh, this bit, bit at the end. I'm actually going to read it out to you. I keep doing that. Like Every time I talk about this, I have to read this, this one passage uh, where the sentence of death is approved. So just to give you some context, obviously, you know, Plato uh, and Socrates were some of the greatest thinkers of all time. I believe it was like Socrates taught Plato who taught Aristotle, who taught Alexander the Great. I might be wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments. So obviously Socrates is just this legendary icon of knowledge and the fact that he was put to death for uh, corrupting the youth of ancient Athens through his teachings, I think is uh, very telling of the attitude that authority has towards wise people, I guess. I'm going to read you this, uh, this paragraph. So, you'll not have bought a lot of time at this price, men of Athens, getting the name from anyone who wants to abuse the city for being the ones who killed off Socrates, a wise man. People who want to find fault with Athens will of course say that I'm wise even if I'm not. At any rate, if you'd waited a little time, you'd have had the same outcome without doing anything. You can see my age for yourselves, how far on I am in life, how near to death. I say this not to all of you, just to those of you who voted to put me to death. And I've got something else to say to the, these, and I've got something else to say to these people. You probably imagine, Athenians, that I stand condemned because I lack the sorts of arguments with which I could have persuaded you, given always that I supposed I should do and say everything to escape the penalty. Far from it. If I've been condemned for the lack of something, it's not a lack of arguments, but a lack of effrontery and shamelessness, and the willingness to address you in the sorts of ways that it please you most to hear, wailing and lamenting and doing and saying plenty of other things unworthy of me. I just think it's awesome that even after he'd been sentenced to death, he was 
able to stand up for himself in that way and uh, Plato immortalized it and here you know thousands of years later I'm reading it and yeah I just think the whole thing there was just lots of interesting stuff that Socrates had to say both on like the subject of freedom of speech but also just some of his politics in general he kind of defended himself and his beliefs for being his beliefs and you know I think and, and anyone has a right to believe what they want to believe you know I mean you can debate those beliefs sure but don't put someone to death for them and in at number one we have Yanis Yonev's Doom 94 also it's Yelgava 94 and it's native Latvian I'll read you the blurb uh, this is actually a blurb by Dave Windass rarely does a book capture the imagination of an the Rarely does a book capture the imagination of an entire generation. Yanis Yonev's Doom 94 is that beast. Via the underbelly and young people of Jelgava in 1994, the writer takes us on the wild trip in Jordan enjoyed by those who experienced their youth at the point when Latvia was gaining its independence for the second time. Having left behind cultural chaos, these kids embraced freedom and the opportunity to transcend the USSR by turning to the alternative lifestyle offered by heavy metal. Here, translated into English for the first time, Yonevs presents a detailed depiction of those heady days through the eyes of those who were there. This was a time for the growing army of metallurgists to stick two fingers up at state-dominated life and explore what the world had to offer through a shared love of music and all that comes with it. Doom 94 was an immediate cult classic when published in its mother tongue and is an exploration of what it is to be released from the rigours of a regime that throttled personal expression. And this, I suppose it's almost like, it's almost like the catcher in the rye for like the 90s metal generation so again this is all set in 1994 it actually starts with like the suicide of Kurt Cobain uh, but then it goes into much more of the like really heavy metal black metal things like that bands like Cynic uh, like Napalm Death were mentioned uh, Mayhem and Burzum and all the Norwegian church burning lot and uh, but then there's like the local Latvian scene as well and you know these kids are all sort of 15 16 they're discovering drugs drinks cigarettes women but at the same time you know they're trying to achieve something with their lives and uh, this is all also autobiographical so it's also a bit almost like reminiscent of on the road I suppose I really enjoyed it because I felt seen by it because I think I wrote in my review on my blog that like that uh, Jelgava in 1994 wasn't too different to Tamworth in 2004. It's the same sort of small town mentality and people wanting to get away from that and music offering a release, you know? So it just, I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well written. I thought the translation was pretty good. There were like one or two minor spelling mistakes I noticed, but just the, the way that the story made me feel, that's the only way I can explain it. It made me feel seen and yeah. I just wish, I want to write something about my youth in Tamworth and I've even planned out a few projects that I've never started because I don't think I can do them justice and this is that book but for Yanis Yonev so I want to I wanna figure out how he did it. So there we have it, those are my top books of Q2 from <laughs> April to June. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think of these books, if you've read any of them, let me know what your favourite books of the quarter were as well. And uh, yeah, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.